Try to understand this land, Australia. Take her as she is, her moods, her mysteries. Mother of us all, beneath the Southern Cross, in her frame of peaceful seas. Try to understand this land, Australia. Take her as she is, her moods, her mysteries. Mother of us all, beneath the Southern Cross, in her frame of peaceful seas. Forest, the hothouse where nature tries out her richest experiments and has done since time began. Not just with plants, but also in the kingdom of birds. Partly this is a story about a very special rainforest, an international treasure, now on the World Heritage List to be saved for all time. But this is also a story about people, drawn here in search of a new and different way of life. Their lifestyles are rich and varied, but one way or another, they all draw inspiration from the rainforest itself. On this journey, I want to show you how people are gaining new understanding of a very ancient place, the rainforest that grows in the shadow of Mount Warning. Every day, the very first part of Australia to be lit by the morning sun is the summit of Mount Warning. Appropriate enough, Mount Warning was once the core of a huge volcano. Those distant mountains, 20 kilometres away, were all part of its crater. The Nightcap Ranges to the south, the Border and McPherson Ranges to west and north. Mount Warning is just about dead centre. This huge volcano literally created the setting for our story. An area 100 kilometres across, here on the easternmost point of Australia's coast. It's 20 million years since Mount Warning erupted, but its influence still affects this whole region, and in a very special way. It takes an expert to explain what happened here, so I spoke to scientist Alex Floyd. Here we have Mount Warning as it is today. Uh, originally, this was a big volcano which was 7,000 feet high, and it went for 50 kilometres in all directions, right out into the Pacific Ocean to the east, a huge mountain. This line of mountains around the base here are the mid-slopes of the original volcano. Now, since then, the Tweed River has eroded out all of this area here to create this great moat or caldera around it. Now, the significance of this is that because of the height of this mountain and its closeness to the sea, it had a very uh, moist climate and there was a great change in uh, temperatures as you went up or down this mountain. And this was a refugial area, a place where plants could retreat to in times of great arid cycles in Australia's history or cold periods. They could move up or down the mountain and find the right conditions to still exist on Earth. Climbing Mount Warning slopes today, you can still see this effect in the changing vegetation. Captain Cook named Mount Warning after nearly being wrecked on dangerous reefs 
that were actually underwater relics of the volcano itself. Very impressive, but not just because of the view. Aboriginals say that this is a powerful place, and many people who come here today get the same eerie feeling. Aboriginal people gave Mount Warning a different name, Wollumbin. Wollumbin was the god of lightning, thunder and storms. It's not hard to imagine that such a god might live up here. feeling. Maybe I should have told the rain god I didn't need a practical demonstration. The truth is, these valleys flood so often the locals have learned to take it in their stride, and it does underline the way the old volcano has created a world of its own. Apart from which, of course, without the rain, there'd be no rainforest. The rainforest first took root because of Mount Warning's rich volcanic soil. The steep, cloud-trapping scarp both watered and protected the forest through millions of years of change. On a world scale, our rainforests are tiny, but they're very rich. Half of all Australia's plants can be found here, and two-thirds of those grow nowhere else in the world. Moving deep into the forest, there's an overwhelming sense of being swallowed up by time, of stepping back thousands of years. This is a primeval world. We know how the law of the jungle applies to animals, kill or be killed. Here, the same law is at work in the kingdom of plants. High on these ridges, in a realm of almost perpetual rain and mist, lives one of the world's most ancient trees, the Antarctic beech. According to National Parks Ranger John Hunter, the Antarctic beach is a positive proof of the theory that Australia was once part of a great supercontinent. Today, relatives of the Antarctic beach occur not only in Australia, but also in South America, New Zealand, New Guinea and New Caledonia. And fossils of Antarctic beach will be found in Antarctica. And over 100 million years ago, the beaches probably covered most of the Australian continent. This one originally had one big stem. And as that stem died off, it's been replaced by side shoots like this one here that's now forming. So that you get a ring of trees around an old decayed stump. Now each of these stems, main stems, could live for several thousand years. So we're looking at something right here that as a living entity has been here for two, five, ten thousand years. It's a little bit of a mystery. It may have been here since the last ice age. Believe it or not, the bird sounds you can hear are all the work of a single extraordinary bird, the lyrebird. 
According to Aboriginal legend, before there were any birds, there was an insect plague. The good spirit Nungina took the last flower stalks in the world and shaped the lyrebird. At once, Lyrebird started eating the insects, doing the job for which he was made. And Aboriginals say the Lyrebird was the first of the birds, and I can't imagine a better explanation for its incredible song. The Lyrebird mimics every other bird in the bush, and does it perfectly. Like the lyrebird, Glenn Threlfo is at home in the forest. Also like the lyrebird, Glenn's a pretty good mimic, as you'll hear in a moment. Glenn's also a lucky man. He's been able to make his love of birds a life work. I usually sneak up on the birds with a, with a big lens um, or I call them in. Sometimes it's possible to call birds if you mind their own calls. Cuckoos are responsive to the call. I, some of them sound like a man whistling a dog. It's a... Just dropping down. The king parrot, he's a, he's a good one to call in. He has that lonely... And you can call them through the... Listen. One answering in the distance. And you can call them up in the rainforest and, and if you can call them to a branch with as good light, then I, I get a few shots of them. I can hear one answering in the distance there already. They must be lonely birds to, to, um, to, you know, to respond to a human call. They get a shock when they see me, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Especially if he's looking for a pretty girl. It's a challenge. The challenge is something that always draws me along. But um, the other end of it is the reward in sharing with people beautiful things that you can find. And uh, I think that so many of us uh, don't really see or appreciate the wildlife that surrounds us. And, and to take beautiful photos and make a film or a book it's something really special and um, it can often sow the seeds of you know, appreciation of nature and natural history. Here's another of Glenn's friends, a chap whose habits are as unusual as his name. We call him Jock the Thief because he, he, he steals from the other bower birds' bowers and he steals from the camper's clothesline. He's, he's probably the most affluent bower bird on the mountain. He's got about 20 times as much plastic and things around his bower as the others have but um, everyone loves his name Jock the Thief it's got a little bit of skullduggery behind it but bower birds just have this fascination for display they're almost human and I think that's why people relate to them so well and they've got to have so much around this bower it's like a, a beautiful um, kingdom or a, like a homestead with a, a spread of, of fancy colourful things to attract the females. Old bus tickets and pegs and biros and bottle tops out of the garbage bins. He, he's got so many other... Listen to him now, listen. He's saying, what are you doing you know, near my place? But actually his song starts off like that when the females come. He sort of starts going... <coughs> and ends up with this terrible sound not unlike excessive human flatulence, it just winding up, cheering. <laughs> so look at him, he's got this, look at this, he's got this blue piece of, piece of stuff here. And he just starts churning and grinding and making all this noise, flapping his wings and fanning his tail, dancing up and down. 
And this is what turns the females on. For thousands of years, rainforests stretched from here to the sea. But just over a hundred years ago, all that began to change. The bird calls of the forest were drowned out by a new and strident song. The first Europeans into this country came by river. They were timber cutters, and the forests along the banks held a rich prize, red cedar. Too big, please, Alan. The timber they sought so eagerly would end up in houses and hotels, not just in Australia, but overseas. Even today, pubs in many a country town still boast a solid cedar bar. Red cedar was a major export long before wool or gold. Red cedar was soon scarce, but there were other trees and the timber industry came to stay. For timbermen, the rewards were high, but it was tough work winning timber with little more than bare hands and bullock teams. Year by year, the timbermen moved deeper into the forest. Year by year, the slow haul to the mill was just a bit longer every time. Soon, all big timber was rare. Very few big trees survived the axe at all, certainly not red cedar. Well, this is one of the bigger remaining red cedars in Australia. Uh, it's very hard to say just how old it might be. Estimates have put it over a thousand years, but that is a little bit difficult. As for why it survived, um, that is also a bit of a mystery. The area surrounding here has been logged in the past, and presumably this tree would have been large enough at that stage to have been cut. It would have had good timber. But all that I can suggest is that um, this tree was kept because uh, the people who were logging here, the loggers who were here, felt that some of them should be left for their grandchildren and their children's children's children to see. The timbermen were always selective loggers, but pioneer farmers had also followed the timber trails and their interest was in the rich volcanic soil. The tragedy was, of course, that so much of the rainforest was destroyed before anyone understood the treasure it really held. Today, people who live here in the shadow of Mount Warning appreciate that loss as never before. What survived of the rainforest is mostly on steep slopes and mountaintops. Pasture and cropland occupies most of the valley floor. But there were rainforest species that only grew down here in the valley. And they've become the most threatened plants of all. Fortunately, something positive is being done about that. And that's what I want to show you now. Here at Coffs Harbour, South of Mount Warning, botanist Alex Floyd is trying to save these threatened trees. 
Some of them grow nowhere in national parks. This is a very special botanical garden. It's a final refuge for some of the rarest plants on earth. Uh, this is called the onion wood, and it's in the same family as the red cedar. It's got a timber very like red cedar, except that it smells of rotten onions. Uh, this is why people weren't interested in it as a timber tree in the early days. This tree was so common around about 1912 that the forester at Mwollombar was trying to organise an export market for the timber of this tree to Europe. It was so common then. But by 1975, there were only two trees left and they were both in cultivation. One in the Botanic Gardens in Sydney and one up near Casino. In the bush, we couldn't find it anywhere. We thought it was extinct. And eventually we found some small seedlings, but we never found any big trees. And it wasn't until some time afterwards that we found out from one of the timber workers up at Kyogle that uh, just by accident some of the cutters had found that if you left a log of this tree lying in a creek for a few weeks, it lost all of this terrible rotten onion smell. And the timber could then be sawn up and you couldn't tell it from red cedar. And from that time on, this tree was in great demand. And that's why there, there aren't any big trees left in the bush today. If human intervention has often been the problem, lately it's part of the solution too. These plants couldn't have got to safety on their own. Remarkable as it may seem, unknown plants are still being found in the rainforest. For some, close to extinction, this garden may offer the best hope of survival. When we planted these, it was actually the centenary of the local school, and we planted two of every plant in here, and we had each class to plant them. And we called it the Noah's Ark, because these plants were coming in two by two, and, and this is the ark, this triangular piece of ground here. It's amazing how quickly the weather can change up here. We're about a thousand metres above sea level, but as the crow flies, only a few kilometres from Australia's most popular beach resort, where no doubt, at this moment, they're swimming in sunshine. This is Surfer's Paradise, a man-made forest, if you like, but a place that draws holiday makers like a magnet. This is also the northern gateway to the rainforest, so people staying here can have the best of two very different worlds. But moving south from surfers, it's a different story. Here, much of the coastline has hardly changed. Where Byron Bay Lighthouse safeguards the easternmost point on Australia's coast, rainforest still reaches down to the sea. In the early 1970s, the beauty of this natural setting began to attract a new kind of settler. They came in search of a dream to a town called Nimbin. Many people came to Nimbin on a remarkable quest. Rejecting city life, they hoped to find new inspiration and new values in a more natural world. Nimbin was a typical quiet country town. Then the new people came. Their arrival came as a bit of a shock to the locals, but at least the upheaval was only temporary, or so it seemed. haven't quite worked out that way. 
Nimbin has remained a world capital of alternative culture. Some of the reasons are those that brought New Age people here in the first place. The warm climate, the rich soil, and the inspiration of the rainforest. Today, the festival site is a grassy hill, but Nimbin is still very much a town of dreams. The town is still a mecca for people seeking an alternative lifestyle, but even the old inhabitants agree that the new people have brought Nimbin back to life. Back in the 1970s, Kate Corkett was one of those new people. She helped organise the original festival. Kate's in no doubt that the Nimbin experiment worked. Most of us came from living in the cities. It was a country lifestyle. It was a new way of sharing, uh, living together, uh, a lot of community involvement. Uh, we actually jokingly said we were going to recycle a town at the time. We, we painted it all up and we've kept that going over the years. We've uh, started many new businesses, different type of businesses. The Nimbin lifestyle may not be for everyone, but one way or another, I think at least some of this new age thinking has rubbed off on most of us. Its influence has certainly reached well beyond Nimbin. This is a new age country market, held at a place called the Channon, not far from Nimbe. And visiting here provokes another interesting thought. This is a make, bake and grow affair, a place where people swap and buy goods they've made. In other words, not really so different, under the skin, to any country market, on any new frontier of the past or present. <laughs> the village of the Channon lies at the head of a valley that became a different kind of new frontier. This is Terrania Creek, an unlikely setting for one of conservation's toughest battles to save the rainforest. Nan and Hugh Nicholson were at the centre of that struggle. They came here in 1973 to realise a lifelong dream, to set up a nursery specialising in rainforest plants. Nan and Hugh were pioneers. It was something no one had done before. But peaceful Terrania Creek seemed a perfect place to start. So we came to this area because it had good soil and uh, good water. But as well as that, the, uh, the Nimbin experiment was occurring at that time, and even though we were independent of that, we were very much caught up in that spirit of getting back to the land and away from the city, trying to become as self-sufficient as possible, and caring for your environment. This little fruit bat is one of many rainforest animals who've wandered in here looking for help. Yeah. Nan and Hugh soon found the forest was much more than just a source of seeds. Their home also became a nursery of a different kind. I'm not sure how that occurred, but we certainly seem to be a centre for minding all sorts of orphan mammals and birds. And at the moment we've got three, a frogmouth and a magpie and a fruit bat. 
And I, I love this. I love telling kids about it and showing other people how to look after the bush. I think it's part of our passion for the, for the rainforest. It really extends into every part of our life. My photography um, of plants started because we were growing tube stock like this. And uh, when a person gets a plant like this, they've got no idea what its flower or fruit is going to look like. And so I started taking photographs to show to people. I had them in an album. And a lot of people said, they're great. Why don't you put them in a book? And uh, from that grew the idea of putting out a rainforest plant book. And it's now developed, so we've got two rainforest plants books. Back when Nan and Hugh were still struggling to establish their nursery, they got caught up in a confrontation, the fight to save Terrania Creek from logging. Today, it's hard to imagine this peaceful setting as a battlefront, but that's exactly what it became. Yeah, the double calls of beauty. <laughs> Like most wars, this one shouldn't have started, and yet it was inevitable. Loggers and an ever more wilderness conscious local community had been on a collision course for a decade. Terrania Creek was the pressure point where both sides decided to stand and fight. It was natural enough for Nan and Hugh to lead the battle that was being fought in their backyard. It was amazing that so many people felt strongly enough to give up uh, their normal lives to be here. I was actually following a Channon market and um, people just came here after Channon market instead of going home to their own places and, and set up camp and stayed on for six weeks. I think also we had realised that the emotions that we had towards the rainforest were in fact backed up by facts and we began to realise how endangered this type of forest was and we realised that we were in a real backs-to-the-wall situation. As the protest continued, it won public support throughout Australia. In the end, that public feeling was crucial to saving Terrania Creek, because when it came to law, the protesters lost their case. The legal battles were fought in the courts, which eventually found in the loggers' favour. But because public opposition didn't let up, the government ignored the courts and stopped logging anyway. The real importance of Terrania Creek was the message the protest sent to government. The public wanted these rainforests saved. Today, most of them are well protected, and the Mount Warning rainforests have been declared World Heritage Areas, internationally recognised as a unique natural treasure. Of course, it's much too easy to see struggles like these in black and white, to point the finger at loggers and make them the villains. Because as long as we keep demanding and overusing timber products, it's our hands, not theirs, that really hold the chainsaw. As I headed down Terrania Valley, the creek downstream still showed plenty of signs of the recent floods. The signs of erosion are obvious enough. Fair warning of the danger of clearing any more forest along these banks. But floods are a natural process and over millennia, They've created the great agricultural prize of this region, the rich flood plains of this valley floor. Everything seems to grow here, including a few crops I didn't expect to find. Ah, just what I needed, a nice cup of tea. Tea's one of the many new crops they're growing here, and not a bad drop either. But that's what you'd expect with a tea master in charge. Michael Grant Cook has brought his skills here from Sri Lanka to start a new industry in the valley. 
This harvester is one of the keys to Michael's success. He designed it himself to pick the best leaf as gently as the hand pickers of traditional tea growing countries. In a nation of tea drinkers like Australia, the most surprising thing is that no one has done it before. Nearby, another new crop is being tried, coffee. This is still a pilot project, but the quality is said to be equal to Kenyan, and the long-term prospects just about limitless. Tea, coffee, bananas. The Tweed Valley is a place where people have always tried to grow something new, and today, that's truer than ever. For all the abundance of this region, the biggest success story of recent years has been the macadamia nut. Like tea and coffee, macadamias are a new commercial crop here, but the macadamia story has a different twist. Macadamias are only just starting to pay off. None of these macadamia plantations are very old, no more than 20 years and it takes nearly half that time before they bear fruit. There are now hundreds of hectares of macadamia plantations growing on the rim of the Mount Warning volcano, and by common consent, they're one of the world's tastiest nuts. This is a growers cooperative called Macadamia Magic. As macadamias are also one of the most expensive nuts in the world, I guess the magic works both ways. This is a new success story, but as I said, it also has a twist. Very nice, but here's the twist. Macadamia trees were developed commercially in Hawaii, and the first Hawaiian macadamia trees came from, you've guessed it, this very part of Australia. Macadamias are Australian native plants. In nature, they only grow in the rainforests around here. So it's a bit embarrassing when someone else finds a treasure you've overlooked in your own backyard. Agricultural scientist Peter Hardwick intends to make sure the same mistake doesn't happen again. I got into bush foods uh, when I was quite young, at, even at four years of age, I was, I was out there eating bush foods and I survived the experience. Then later on, when I was uh, in my late teens, I became very concerned about the destruction of rainforests. And uh, I was also very keen on horticulture. Oh, this is a native ginger here. That's a little blue fruit, very distinctive. Quite acidic, very distinctive acidic taste. <coughs> Spit the seeds back out into the forest. I decided to, to, to make a point out of the bush foods in, in, in that showing people who weren't that sympathetic to preserving rainforest that there was a lot more there than what met the eye. There's something there in our, in our forest which could be of economic significance. This is the scrambling lily, often called native asparagus. And you can see it fruiting here. And uh, the way you eat it, of course, it's very similar to asparagus. You eat the shoots. And you can actually see a shoot here as well. But the main thing is, the moment it's bearing, and I want to get those berries so I can grow it and um, plant plenty of them. And, and hopefully one day they'll end up in people's grocery store shelves. Basically, what I'm trying to do, of course, is uh, commercially develop the scrambling lily amongst other native plants and uh, what I need is plenty of seed and I need to plant a lot of seedlings and uh, by planting a, a very wide range of seedlings from different sites I'm able to actually get a good selection 
and then by getting the good selection, uh, we're away with commercial production. As every good cook knows, the ultimate test of any food is the taste. To taste test what may become completely new commercial crops, Peter becomes his own guinea pig. Here we have some bunyas and some lily pilly. And this is actually called the ryeberry lily pilly. I froze these a few months ago when they were bearing. And it's an excellent fruit. It's quite aromatic. It's got a clove-like, ginger-like flavour. And it's great in, in um, sauces, jams. You can even make a nice liqueur out of it. And the bunyas are very similar to a chestnut, a European chestnut. But uh, one of the things that makes them rather different is, of course, they come off a, a giant conifer tree, a giant pine tree. And this is the cone here. You can see the size of it. It's, it's enormous. And uh, this is a lily pilly sauce here I've made up. And it goes great with another fruit called uray, but I haven't got any uray at the moment. And I'm just going to serve a bit up and put it on the bunyas. They're, they're, very, they're a bit on the acidic side, so I like to put a bit of honey or sweetener with them. But it depends on the palate. Some people would like them uh, un, uh, unsweetened, perhaps. Peter's hopes are more than a dream. He's working closely with the Tropical Fruit Research Station. It's early days yet, but it's nice to think that, thanks to Peter, Australian menus of the future might include some truly authentic local flavours, like banya nut pie or lily pilly jam. It's a funny thing, but when we humans cross a border, we expect to see a dotted line. The rainforest makes no such distinction. But as you move from New South Wales to Queensland, the mountain does change names, from the border ranges to Lamington National Park. Lamington is one of our oldest and best loved national parks. And O'Reilly's guest house, high on the plateau, is perhaps our most famous guest house and my final destination. They say to enjoy a rainforest, you need a clearing. Well, they say that here, and I agree. One side of the road is National Park, the other side is O'Reilly's. Peter O'Reilly runs the guest house today, but it was his father and uncles who had what Peter still calls the luck of the Irish. They were both the first and last settlers here. Well, they arrived up here in um, 1911, actually. They selected their land and they selected uh, dairying rocks. These, these were, yeah, they dairied anywhere in those days, right up on the tops of the mountains. And um, although it was very isolated. And what did happen, of course, in 1915, the uh, national park was formed around them and this isolated them in the middle of a, a national park. And it meant that they had to carry cream about nine miles down the mountain on horseback uh, into the valley and then as soon as they got a track down into the valley people started to visit the area and uh, you know this and this is really why they started the guest town. In the month of May everybody smiling it makes you feel so gay you hike and you sing along the track and you come back to O'Reilly's shack and stand O'Reilly's is still a family guest house, and over 60 years the O'Reilly family have cemented their place both on the Lamington Plateau and in Australian folklore. Oh, and you will get the itch, find a 
A visit to O'Reilly's still feels very much like coming home. During the day, the guest house becomes a base camp of journeys of discovery that start right at the front door. But if some of the rainforest's hungrier inhabitants like to meet you halfway, it's the rainforest itself that people really come to see. This one's the this is the strangler fig, huh? Yeah, strangler fig. The tracks around O'Reilly's range for miles. You just take your pick. Everything from a morning stroll to a grueling four-day hike. You could explore here for weeks, but for one of Lamington's best adventures, you simply step out of the guest house and into space. This remarkable rope walk takes you right up into the canopy. For Peter O'Reilly, creating it was the fulfillment of a dream. It has always been a dream of mine to be able to get up into the canopy and see the flowering and fruiting trees and that sort of thing. It was a sort of crazy dream, actually, that uh, eventually it worked. Most of the action in a rainforest is up where, in the canopy where the sun is, where the trees flower and fruit, and that's what the area we wanted to get into. As far as I know, this is something you can't do anywhere else in Australia. Get right up where the action is. And, if you're game, you can climb up higher still. We started this journey on top of a volcano, so I suppose it's fair enough to finish it up a tree. I guess this is what you'd have to call a bird's eye view. In any weather, from any viewpoint, the rainforest is a spectacular and dramatic setting. This old volcano, Mount Warning, certainly started something when it burst through the Earth's core 20 million years ago. As I said at the outset, in recent years, people have begun to find new inspiration in this very ancient place. After exploring the rainforest, I can only add that it's no wonder they do. Before we leave here, there's just one more thing I have to do. You may have noticed that around here, everybody's planting something. So I thought that I'd get in the act too. But the whole purpose of this plantation is to make sure that rainforest timbers are available to future generations. So my black bean won't be here forever. It's due for harvest 200 years from now. Try to understand this land, Australia. Take her as she is, her moods, her mysteries. Mother of us all, beneath the Southern Cross, in her frame of peaceful seas. Try to understand 
this land Australia Take her as she is, her moods, her mysteries Mother of us all, beneath the sun 